Washington Journal continues. We want to welcome Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the Democrat from South Florida. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Steve. Let's begin first with this new study that came out this week. You're a breast cancer survivor. We want to hear your story in a moment, but your reaction. Uh, well, I, I was very disturbed. Uh, the, the recommendations that the task force has come out with are, are very troubling. To suggest that women 40 to 49 no longer need uh, to get a mammogram routinely will ensure that, that more women that, at, in that age range will die. Um, the task force is essentially saying that for every one woman we save, in that age range, 1,900 women will possibly get more anxious or, you know, have an unnecessary biopsy. Um, but it, it still means that more women will die. They acknowledge that. They just don't, don't apparently think it matters all that much. And that's just totally appropriate. Confuses women. We finally have in this country women over 40. About 72% of women over 40 get a routine mammogram every year. And we don't need to confuse women any further. Plus, you have the American Cancer Society, Komen Foundation, major cancer groups that all are opposed to these recommendations and are recommending that women continue to get routine mammograms once they turn 40. Why do you think this recommendation came out? Well, there it continues to be a debate among scientists, among public health professionals, not practicing oncologists, but on, among health, public health professionals, that if you that mammograms are not not a perfect screening, and they aren't, but that if, if you're younger and younger women have more dense breasts and it's more difficult to uh, to catch breast cancer than it is as you get older, and so there has been a sort of a debate as to just exactly when you should uh, routinely get a mammogram. And they looked at the same data five years ago and recommended 40, 40 and older for routine mammograms, and now they're changing their mind. And it's just really unfortunate and confusing. Your own situation, two years ago, you went to the doctors. What happened? No, actually, two years ago, I was doing a breast self-exam in the shower, um, and I found a lump myself. Uh, I was 41. and you know, thought, okay, this is probably just a cyst, but that it wasn't there before. I was familiar enough with the look and feel of my breast because I did self-exam, you know, fairly often and uh, went to the doctor and within about a week after having a biopsy, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And self-examination was also part of this study, trying to limit <clears throat> the self-examination. What's the reasoning behind that? Actually, the task force is recommending that women don't do self-exam, uh, which is uh, ludicrous because uh, an overwhelming majority, particular, uh, particularly of women 40 to 49, found their breast cancer when, when they were 40 to 49 years old themselves through breast self-exam. So I think it's a ludicrous recommendation. Um, breast self-exam by itself is not, is, is not the you know, foolproof in terms of screening, but routine mammogram once you're older than 40, breast self-exam, clinical breast exams, which the task force is also recommending against for women 40 to 49, those are all important tools when put together make it more likely that we're going to detect a young wo younger woman's breast cancer early. And the American Cancer Society says that as well as the Komen Foundation and other major cancer groups and the National Cancer Institute and CCN. Uh, so there's a body of, of uh, opposition on the, on the other side of these task force's recommendations. The other frustrating thing, Steve, is that this, uh, this group, uh, this task force, um, number one, it's important to note, they're not a government task force. They're an independent group, and none of them are cancer specialists. No oncologists sit on this task force. They're a group of public health professionals. We have a list, and we're going to show it now to our audience. These are members of the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. Uh, it's a rather lengthy list. Bruce uh, Colon is the chair of that, and Diane Petiti is the vice chair. But this is formed in part through the Department of Health and Human Services. What else can you tell us about this task force and these members? Well, I, I don't really know very much about the members, the membership, other than that I do know that none of them are cancer specialists. None of them are oncologists. They're a task force that are appointed by uh, you know, the, um, you know, the, the administration through, uh, and all of them were appointed in the last administration. Uh, they're appointed through the Agency for Health Quality Research, and they make recommendations on uh, you know, public, general public health recommendations. Uh, th these recommendations are pretty specific. Um, it's, it's really, I don't know anything about the individual experts. They're, they're public health professionals. Um, I'm not sure why they continue to weigh in on can cancer guidelines. We have a phone line set aside if you are a breast cancer survivor. The number to call is 202 6020 
Otherwise, we're dividing our phone lines regionally as we talk about this new recommendation and its uh, reaction with Debbie Wasserman Schultz. She represents Florida's 20th Congressional District, which includes Fort Lauderdale. And just some background on this commission, it's made up of representatives from the Colorado Department of Public Education, a professor at the University of Iowa, the Department of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital Center in Cincinnati, the Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, the Health Partners from Minneapolis, Minnesota, University of Missouri School of Medicine. Right. No, I mean, they're a group of scientists who, they, they, their expertise is in public health. There is a debate in the, in the cancer community um, between public health professionals who think more broadly about all women in general and medi practicing medical specialists who see individual women. This group and public health professionals generally try to make recommendations, at least in my observation, that consider women as a whole and try to, you know, make decisions for what's good for most women as opposed to thinking about what's good for an individual woman. So they're essentially saying we don't really think about whether one woman or ten women or ten thousand women lose their lives because this broader group of women may have more anxiety or angst or have overdiagnosis or an unnecessary procedure and if you're that woman <laughs> that you know loses their life um, that gets diagnosed with breast cancer at a much later stage that's not okay with you in that week between your own self-examination <clears throat> and your diagnosis did you think it was breast cancer you know I, I knew that uh, I had uh, had a mammogram a few weeks before that it was uh, it was clean uh, I, I knew that finding that lump wasn't normal for me so I, I feared it was breast cancer but I wasn't sure and you know quite frankly I was given a lot of options I could have waited and watched it women 40, um, 40 to 49 and women under 40 it's often more aggressive and it's often diagnosed at a later stage because so often healthcare professionals say you know it's not likely to be breast cancer let's watch it and see what happens in a few months if on top of that those kinds of problems we're now going to tell women 40 to 49 they shouldn't routinely get a mammogram, then we know we're going to catch fewer breast cancers early, which is the key to women's survival. And so what treatment did you select? I had a double mastectomy because in talking with uh, my doctors and, and uh, health care team, uh, it was also suggested that I get the genetic test to see whether, based on my family history, I had uh, the, gen the breast cancer gene, which I turned out to have, and it made it much more likely that I'd have a recurrence. So I had, a, a, even though my breast cancer was caught very early, I had a double mastectomy and ultimately had my ovaries removed because I had an increased risk of ovarian cancer as well. Let's get to your phone calls. Susan is joining us from North Richland Hills, Texas, with Representative Debbie Wasserman <laughs> Schultz. Good morning, Susan. Well, I think you're just wonderful, uh, Thank you. uh, Representative. Uh, but I have just been furious over that. I'm, I'm 60, uh, almost 66, so this really doesn't affect me. But I see this as just another assault on women. If this had been brought out about prostate cancer and men waiting and only a few would die, all political parties, this little team that bought this up belongs to. And I think it's amazing that all Republicans have such great insurance and love the CEOs um, who shave off all the profits and make our medical decisions. I, I just find all of this amazing. Well, I, I think it's important that we not politicize breast cancer. Um, I, I, this is not a partisan issue. There are Republicans and Democrats that have come out against this task force's recommendations. I don't question the political motives of this force. I think that they are a group of public health professionals that just aren't thinking about the ramifications to individual women. And, you know, I, every young woman that I know has the goal of becoming an older woman. <laughs> I mean, I know I want to one day be 66 years old like you. And the, the recommendations that this task force is putting forward will make that less likely for, for the tens of thousands of women who are now saying you shouldn't routinely get a mammogram if, once you turn 40. Uh, you shouldn't do it a, until you're 50 and then only every two years. And we know we're going to catch fewer breast cancers. The task force acknowledges that fewer breast cancers will be, will be caught. But they're saying that the angst that will be caused and the possibility of overdiagnosis or an unnecessary biopsy here or there uh, makes it not worth recommending routine mammograms and so that's just I think those recommendations are totally uh, inappropriate. White House Deputy Communications Director Dan Pfeiffer is quoted this morning in the New York Times put on the White House website uh, quote that women who currently receive mammograms under Medicare will continue to be able right. to get them there are no plans to change that. 
Patty is joining us from Pittsburgh, a breast cancer survivor. Good morning, Patty. Hi, good morning. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Thank you. Hey, congratulations on being a survivor. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was diagnosed at 49. I probably had my cancer for two years prior to that. I have in my family never had seen any incidents of any cancer of any kind. Under these guidelines, I would be dead. I'm a widow with a young son, and he would be an orphan. Had it not been for this, if we, under these guidelines, I'm not the only one that would be dead. I was stage three. So this was not, ooh, it popped up six months ago. This, it, it's unconscionable that, that this station is, well, let's sacrifice a few. Which few? I, I, Your family, my family, it, it's, I can't, I, it can't possibly be cost effective. It's, it's incredulous to me. I, I completely agree with you. I, 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 don't, I don't understand how, uh, and actually uh, Dr. Otis Brawley, who's the medical director for the American Cancer Society, um, he, he's been commenting, <coughs> excuse me, he's been commenting over the last couple of days saying that the task force's recommendations uh, acknowledge that this, uh, th this recommendation will, uh, you know, recommending that women 50 to 59 have mammograms will save uh, more lives than women 40 to 49, but that in women 40 to 49, we're just not going to save enough of them. So it's not worth the trade-off of the overdiagnosis, the anxiety uh, that it causes women in that age group. And I don't know, I just find that incredibly patronizing. Uh, what, what, I, uh, what I know is that women, when empowered with more information and giving women knowledge, gives them tools to make decisions about their own health. You are one of how many yearly diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 40? There are 28,000 women under the age of 45 diagnosed with breast cancer every year in the United States, and there are about 10,000 women under 40. Antoinette is joining us from Grand Forks, North Dakota. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, hi. hi. Hi, Steve. Good morning. Uh, listen to the show all the time. First time calling in, but this, this, this issue uh, it, to me, I think that uh, this is an insult to women for for public health officials to to even recommend something like this uh, is an insult. I was di diagnosed uh, in in 2007, almost exactly two years ago. I found the lump, my, the lump myself. Yes. When I found it, uh, and I'm I'm 50, I'll be 59 next week. When I found the lump uh, and got, finally got to the doctor, got the mam mammogram, it was a stage three. And the, I think the sad part about it uh, uh, for me was that I spent a year in Germany with my, my daughter and my son-in-law because he was deployed at the time. I was on a military base. I was denied a mammogram. At, at that base in Germany, uh, at Longstool, and that was the first year in 11 years that I had not had a mammogram, and by the time I got back to the States the following year in 07, that cancer was found uh, five months later, and it was a stage three. Antoinette, how are you doing today? Uh, today, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, so far, I am cancer-free. Uh, I went, went through, had to have a... Um, uh, eventually a mastectomy. Initially I chose the lumpectomy, mm -hmm. but uh, because of it being an aggressive cancer, because of me being being a black female, right. uh, put you more at risk. Yeah, and you know, and, and I, had, I went through the whole thing. Chemo, radiation, I uh, had a, a terrible fungal infection, <coughs> and I am just starting to get to get on my feet uh, physically. Well, I'm glad that you're well. Um, that's the other problem, Steve, is that <clears throat> often women 40 to 49 are diagnosed because they're in a higher risk population. African American young women are at greater risk for a more aggressive type of breast cancer called basal cell type. Their, their death rate is generally higher than Caucasian women. Ashkenazi Jewish women like myself, we're generally, di it, that's what sort of indicated that I had a risk factor because I was 41.
found that I'm a, a Jewish woman of Ashkenazi descent, which is Eastern European descent. That was an indicator that I was likely more at risk to be a carrier of that breast cancer gene. So because younger women are generally in higher risk populations when we get breast cancer, if we're not routinely getting a mammogram, if we're not encouraged to do breast self-exam at all, if our doctors are told clinical breast exams really aren't going to be that helpful either, then you're leaving younger women with no tools to detect breast cancer early. And you're telling them, you know what, squeeze your eyes shut, cross your fingers, and hope that we get you to 50 so that when you do have those mammograms every two years, hopefully we'll catch it at that point. But as she said, it's much more likely to be later stage at that point, and your risk of having more treatment is, is higher, and your risk of survival is, is lower. We're talking about this breast cancer uh, report that came out earlier this week. Our guest is Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz in her third term in the U.S. House of Representatives. Her district includes Davies in Fort Lauderdale. This Twitter comment from a viewer who says, I personally know eight women between the ages of 25 to 35 who are breast cancer survivors because they got mammograms. They would be dead under these guidelines. We'll go to Ellen, who's joining us from Shenandoah, Virginia. Good morning. Uh, yes, good morning. I am just so angry over this. It just infuriates me. And then when I don't get angry, it just makes me want to cry. <laughs> I'm a 55-year-old woman, and um, after months of asking to be put on hormone <coughs> replacement therapy, I was told it greatly increases my risk of breast cancer. I'm not even going to address the age groups because I didn't have insurance. I went 13 years without a mammogram or a pap test. So um, it just enrages me. I wish women would take to the streets, but, of course, that's not going to happen. I'm not clear on something. Are women not supposed to self-exam to prevent them experiencing anxiety? That just makes no sense to me. I agree with you. Uh, the task force is also saying that breast self-exam is not recommended because they say that, that they cite a study, a large study that was done in China that shows that breast self-exam women telling us that we can't handle the, the, the more knowledge and more information about our own individual diagnoses and our healthcare professionals can't handle guiding us through a decision about what we should do if we do find something. Which is exactly what Joe twittered in as you're making your comment. He says, so based on this experience, does the guest feel it's a good idea to depend on panels of experts for your life's choices? Well, the, the, the concern with the task force's recommendations, uh, I mean, they're doing their jobs, they're a group of scientists, and you know that, that they were doing what they were asked to do. The concern is that in this, in this country, health care reform Insurance companies in healthcare, insurance companies drive coverage decisions. They, they are the ones that drive the types of healthcare we can get. And so the concern is whether healthcare insurance companies under the current system are going to use this task force's recommendations, tell women 40 to 49, we're not going to pay for your routine mammograms anymore. And again, some background this task force uh, commissioned by the Department of Health and Human Services, many appointed in the previous administration, the Bush administration. It's called the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. This is what the website looks like, and Eileen is joining us from Elmira, Oregon. Good morning. Good morning, Steve. How are you? Fine, this thank is you. Good Hi, morning. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> I am a breast cancer survivor. I've known about my, and I'm 76. I knew about my breast cancer in 41, when I was 41, and my husband became very ill, and he has since died. Uh, so we paid attention to him more than we did me, but. When I we got to the point that we were so poor retirement-wise that I had the my Peter DeFazio's office told me about Susan B. Coleman, mm -hmm. and I had two mammograms through Susan B. Coleman. We were going up to the medical university in or in Portland, and we found uh, I found an oncologist there, and we looked at me, and I ended up having two lumpectomies, uh, five core sample treatments, and we decided to take the breast off. It just simple had to be done. It was ductal carcinoma that didn't stay in situ. So this is when you were in your 40s, or well, I started in my 40s. Okay. But what happened was, with my husband's illness, we paid attention to him. And when I turned almost <laughs> well, when I had my Susan B. Coleman, my last Susan B. Coleman mammogram, the doctors got very concerned. 
and we were going up to the medical university, and we got an oncologist up there, and I told him I wasn't 55 yet. I can't afford anything right now. So he cut a deal with me for, what, two months. I went up there. He did a sonogram and did a little teaching with some of the, the residents and things like that. And I and he said he would do it for free if I would bring him jokes. Once. I'm so glad that you that you are a survivor. And uh, but I'm that's... a wonderful survivor, and I'm a wonderful spreader of everything. That... But you, and your story is an example of uh, the problem here is that you have women who have you know difficulty obtaining coverage for uh, to pay for mammograms. And now that this task force is recommending women to 40 to 49 shouldn't even have them routinely, that's not only more confusing, but makes it more likely that women are going to have to fight to get covered when they do need one. It's just, it makes absolutely no sense. But it is important to note, Steve, that there's nothing changing here. The, the Department of Health and Human Services, this is not, a, even though it's a task force that had this review commissioned by the, the Agency for Health Quality Research, they're a group of scientists. It's an independent group. The government is not changing their recommendations uh, on women 40 to 49. Uh, there's a difference between policymakers and scientists. These are scientific recommendations. They're being reviewed, but uh, Medicare will continue to cover mammograms for women uh, in, in the current set of guidelines, and every major cancer organization continues to recommend that the current guidelines remain in place. To our listeners on uh, C-SPAN Radio, our guest is Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Let me ask you personally, what was the thought process that you went through in determining your um, treatment plan? Well, I, once I found the lump, um, you know, I knew that was not normal for me, and I knew it was important to get into my doctor right away because we needed to, I needed to see what, what it was. Um, and it could have just been a cyst, but I was given a few different choices. I was told it, uh, I could have a biopsy. Uh, I was told that I, I could have a, what's called a fine needle aspiration where they could draw out some cells, but there was a risk if it was cancer that that could cause those cells to break off and spread somewhere else in my body. Uh, I was also given the option of waiting and watching and going home and doing nothing. Um, that wasn't an appropriate option for me, uh, in my opinion, and so I had a biopsy. The biopsy did find it was breast cancer. And originally, because I had, uh, I had the diagnosis so early, it was uh, really just a half a centimeter uh, uh, tumor, um, they recommended a lumpectomy and radiation. But then because we had more extensive conversations, that I was an Ashkenazi, you know, Ashkenazi Jew, uh, that I was 41, that I did have, that we did a cancer history. I didn't have any cancer in my immediate family, so no, no family history. I did have two great aunts, which isn't considered family history, that had had breast cancer. So at that point, they just said, you know what? You're an Ashkenazi Jew. You're 41 years old. Uh, we should do this genetic test, uh, which means they draw blood and see whether I had either the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation. Uh, they also said, probably you don't. Um, but a month later, when the results came back, uh, it turned out that I was a carrier of the BRCA2 gene mutation, which put me at an 85% risk over my lifetime for getting breast cancer, and a, between a 40 and 85% chance of a recurrence. So at that point, I decided to have a double mastectomy. I didn't need chemo and radiation after I did that, uh, but um, had a year's worth of treatment, went through seven surgeries, um, had my ovaries removed, and you know I wanted to do everything I could to make sure that I would be around for my kids for a long time. But if these guidelines were in place, as a lot of the callers have said, I would not have even had an opportunity to get a mammogram, would have been discouraged from doing breast self-exam, and would not have annually, when I saw my OBGYN, gotten a clinical breast exam. And emotionally, what were you dealing with? Well, when you're diagnosed, I mean, that's the, that's the call that every woman dreads. Uh, when you're told you have breast cancer, it's like, getting hit with an anvil. It's like a crushing weight uh, that crashes down on you. I have three young children. My kids were eight and four <clears throat> at the time that I was diagnosed. And, uh, it, you know, I panicked. Am I going to be around for them? You know, I, I've been married for, at the time, for seven years. Um, you know, am I going to, am I going to see my, my 18th or 20th anniversary? Um, it, early detection was the key for me. Finding my breast cancer early knowing that it was important to use breast self-exam as a part of a range of potential screening at the time that I turned 40. Those were tools that I knew if I used them, I would make it more likely that I'd catch breast cancer. And I had absolutely no idea, even though I'd been a breast cancer advocate as a legislator for 17 years, passed breast cancer legislation in Florida, 
I had no idea that I was more at risk as an Ashkenazi Jew for that gene mutation. If I wasn't vigilant about breast self-exam and getting a mammogram, I would never have found out and who knows what, whether I'd be here talking to you today. Rita is joining us from Wilmington, Illinois, also a breast cancer survivor. Good morning, Rita. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to state that I do disagree with all of these guidelines. Um, am I... Yeah, you're, oh, I, okay. me too. I wasn't sure if I was on or <laughs> no, not. No, no, no. No, we can hear you, Rita. Please go I ahead. Do. I disagree with all of the guidelines. I was diagnosed just before okay, um, with uh, HER2 breast cancer, mm -hmm. which is an aggressive breast cancer yes. also. Um, and the only way it was found was mammogram. There was not a lump. I, I did not have any signs or symptoms of having cancer or anything. It was only found through a mammogram. And then um, prior to my surgery, where they were going to do a lumpectomy, they did um, an MRI, which found a second mass in the same breast and another mass in the other breast. Um, so only through the MRI, they couldn't get it through an ultrasound mm -hmm. or the mammogram as far as the other masses. So I did end up having a mammogram um, just of the one breast. The, the other breast states right. that it was benign. Um, so I'm, I'm really upset over these guidelines. Um, no risk factors in my family. Nobody's right. had any kind of cancer or breast cancer. Um, it, it was just, I mean, even my siblings were like, the doctors must be wrong. You can't have cancer. You don't well, have I know. risk factors. are not there. That's right. So, uh, you know, I'm really upset over these guidelines. And what makes me even more upset over these guidelines is that the insurance companies are going to dictate this. Well, 75% of women, Rita, who, uh, when they're diagnosed with breast cancer, have no risk factors at all. That's, I mean, so th this task force uh, is saying that what we should do now, if you're 40 to 49, is talk with your doctor and discuss your risk factors. And then they could recommend, based on your risk factors, whether you should have a mammogram as an individual. But 70, 70 to 75% of women don't have any risk factors. So as a result, that they would have that conversation with their doctor and their doctor would tell them not to worry about it. And they would wait all the way until they're 50, have a, a mammogram every couple of years, and hope patients are totally ill. And the, the issue here is that insurance, we need to make sure that insurance companies don't make a coverage decision based on this task force's recommendation. And American Cancer Society, Komen Foundation, and the government continues to say that you should get a routine mammogram older than 40. This task force is, are just recommendations. Uh, it is not the policy of uh, the U.S. government. So finally, bottom line for you and others, you know your own body? You should know, be familiar with the look of, and feel of your breasts. Know what's normal for you so that you know when something feels different. Discuss your own personal history with your, with your doctor. And at this point, continue to get a mammogram routinely once you turn 40 years old. Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz from South Florida, thanks for being with us. Thanks, thanks for, for sharing me. your story. Thank you. Please come back again. I would have to. We're going to turn our attention to the larger issue of health care and a.